Thank you, Ryan. Look, what I'm going to talk to you about is literally right here as it shrinks. <laughs> Being tall is fun. Look, I don't really have to say much tonight. I do have some really cool things I want to cover, but I really want you to know that most of everything I'm talking about is literally right here in this book, and I almost don't have to say anything. If anything, this is like us diving into the Word of God, and I'm going, all right, so, I mean, that's pretty cool, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sort of cool, yeah. So, who likes to read Bibles? A lot of hands here. That means I've got a lot of volunteers. Who's going to read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 13? Who wants to read it? Ryan, go for it. Hold on one second, Ryan. Romans 12, 1 through 13. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Through 13? Yes, sir. All right. For by the grace given, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, <clears throat> but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed for, to each of you. For, for just as each of us has one body with many members, all these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesizing, then prophecy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Do I need to even go any further in a sermon? I need to? Thank you, Ryan. You just got basically a cliff notes of this is how you should treat your neighbor. This is how you should love each other. If you're called to do something, do it well. Do it to the best of your abilities. You know what we see today in our society? Let me show you the state of our society. Some of you, I hope this doesn't go too far over your heads, but hopefully one day things will be a little bit different. But currently, this is what the state of our society is. We have false accusations. We have hatred. We have division. We have calls to abolish law enforcement. We have intentional destruction without cause. We have temporary abolition of the sovereignty of a state. I know that's a lot of big words. If you need me to, I'll explain that one a little bit. The abolition of the sovereignty of a city or state means that we are not going to listen to the laws of that city or that state. We're going to ignore them, and we're going to make our own rules up. And those rules are probably not going to help anybody except for the person trying to make the rules. Excuses to destroy innocent businesses or property, lies and corruption, conspiracies, politics that are creating social divisions, Anger, demonstrations, marches, violence, darkness. Where is God? Yeah. 
How do you be a big light in a dark world? Ryan, read Romans 12, 2 again, please. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry, babe. Yeah, I'll give my wife, Brittany, a hand. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Don't be conformed. Everything you just saw on that previous slide, don't allow that to influence you to be just like what you saw. That is what the world is trying to train you to do. It is not found in the Bible anywhere. I've read it. Who here has read the Bible? All the way through from cover to cover, keep your hands up. God bless you. Read it again. Why? Do not let the book of the law depart from your mouth. Keep reading it. Don't stop. So if we see verse 2, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, then that must mean we have to live according to a different standard, right? Because if that's the world standard, what we just saw, then we can expect the exact same results to repeat themselves every single time. But if we were to live the way God called us to live, if we treated the, the people around us the way God told us to treat people who are just like you one way or another, even if it's just skin, muscle, and blood, we'd have a, dude, we'd have such a different world. That first slide wouldn't even exist. Instead, we'd have this peace and harmony and love instead of people hating their neighbors. So how do we change this? <sighs> Who's got Matthew 5.13? Go for it, Emily. Hold up. I'll get her. Oh, my goodness. You are the salt of the earth, but the salt should lose its taste. What? But if the salt loses its taste, how can it be made salty? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. There is only one difference between sand and salt. That's not true. Where's my chemistry people at? <laughs> That's not true. NACL is totally different. Anyways. Salt has one main difference. If we forget about chemistry for two seconds and the, the, the molecules and mathematical formula to create it, right? Very, very many different versions of salt. But if we take it all down to one basic thing, it's a crystal, right? One difference between sand and salt is taste. Go outside, grab a handful of salt, taste it. <sniffs> now do the same with sand. Which would you rather be? Let's think about this for a second. What are the many uses of salt? Well, you can cure meats. I just ate some cured meat. Beef jerky. You can pickle things. I love pickling things. Anybody else love pickling things? Yeah, buddy. It's used for sanitization, so we can purify things, right? You have salt chlorination, which is used in a lot of swimming pools nowadays. Did you know that? Keeps the pool clean, sanitizes it. I work with pools, so I know this. It also helps in, you know, healing your wounds. Ancient methods was you put salt on your wound. Why? Sanitized it. Helped it heal. Burned a lot. But sometimes burning is a good thing. Yeah? I'm just trying to make sure everybody's with me. Some people are enjoying cell phones. It's okay. Hopefully these, these words will still hit you subconsciously. Cooking and taste, they flavor a food. For seasoning... Health-wise, the body requires 2,300 milligrams of sodium every single day. Sodium is essential for nerve and muscle function and is involved in the regulation of fluids in the body. Sodium also plays a role in the body's control of blood pressure. So salt is a good thing. I haven't told you what sand does, have I? 
Do you think if you ate a handful of sand, it would do the same thing as salt? <laughs> Probably not. Sand is good for really one thing. Being put underneath your feet. Salt is good for your tongue. Sand is good for your feet. What would you rather be when you consider helping somebody around you? Would you rather be something that they walk on because you have no use? Or would you rather change their world by being something that is pleasing to them? So that when the salt of your words, of your actions, lands on their tongue, they actually feel satisfaction instead of going... Salt's a little bit of a better idea. Pastor Ron even said that this Sunday. He even spoke about it. He said, salt irritates, it penetrates, and it purifies. Salt has a purpose, so does sand. You can take sand and you can build structures, right? But we even see that in, I think it was Matthew talking about the the man who built his house on the sand. How'd that go for him? I've seen a lot of problems with sand. <laughs> it's great at the beach. So salt has a purpose. So don't lose your saltiness. Stay in the word of God. Who has Colossians 4, 5, and 6? Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Miss Martha! Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Well, what does that mean, guys? What does it mean to have your conversation seasoned with salt? Yeah, it's godly conversation. It's, it's everything we just talked about. When you look at the many uses of salt, curing, sanitization, cooking and taste, the health. If you're talking with somebody else and you're demonstrating a nice, sweet way of talking to them, do you think they're going to want to listen to you? If I sat here very, very angry and said, hey, guys, bad words, bad words, nothing that's going to build you up, no positivity whatsoever, are you going to want to listen to me? You want to hear somebody that's positive, right? Somebody who's happy, somebody who has a bunch of joy in their hearts, right? That's what you call saltiness, right? It's a different conversation if I'm talking to you with positivity and happiness. When I'm sitting here saying, Ryan, you're awesome at what you do. When you take a stand for the Lord, it's awesome. Your leadership skills are going to get developed, and you're going to be an amazing leader when you get older. Does that feel better than, Ryan, really? What kind of shirt is that, dude? (laughs) What an idiot. Is that helpful? Does that build you up? Don't get distracted, Grant. My point is, is you can never help somebody by beating them in the head with a baseball bat of truth. That doesn't help anybody. Somebody read Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Miss Brittany is running. We saw a hand. She's getting there. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Does everybody get that? We're talking about old world for a minute. So they didn't have electricity, right? So they had candles. And when you took a candle and you put it on on a stand it would shine throughout the entire house and people would be able to see where they were going, right? Nowadays, we don't have to worry about that. We flick on a light switch and we're good. I can see where I'm going. This is fantastic, right? 
It doesn't make sense for me to sit here and spray paint a light black and then try to turn it on. You're not going to see it. In the same way, if you cover up the light that is in you, how are you going to help the people around you? How are you going to change the world? You can't do it, right? You got to be visible. You got to be out there. You can't sit at home or on the sidelines and expect your team to win. You got to be proactive about it, right? City on a hill can't be hidden. If your light is so bright, nothing is going to cover it up. Nothing. So how quickly do you notice a light in a dark room? Hit it. Volunteers, come on up. I want you to see something. All right, you get the point, right? It's kind of dark out here. Did I lose everybody's attention? Somebody say something. I got your attention still, right? Now, obviously, we can't go completely dark in here just for the sake of security and liabilities. We want to make sure you're safe. But how quickly would you see a light in a pitch black room? How well is this working for you? I can actually see faces, though, right now, right? Yeah. What's the problem with this, though? It's only one light. Yeah. Right now, it's the only light in this dark room, if we were to really think about it. I mean, yeah, you can sit here and say that this screen's kind of lit up. We're seeing light coming through the windows. But if this was a pitch black room, this would be the only piece of light you could see. I mean, I can see your shirt. I can see your face. You're staring straight at me. Elias, I can still see the mask on your face. I can see your eyes are smiling because I'm talking to you. <laughs> and what happens when I take 12 people and I start rubbing off on them? I start lighting their candles. Come on over, guys. Do you see what's happening here? We got lights off of one. And they're spreading. They're moving throughout the sanctuary. It's not a ritual. This is not a cult. Yeah. There's some salt. It burns a little, doesn't it? I'm going to let everybody kind of spread out a little bit more. But I want you to see something. Guys, kind of move a little bit closer to the center so the kids can kind of see. Are you seeing a little bit of a difference now? You see a lot more light in here, right? I know this kind of looks kind of weird, right? Just bear with me. It's just candles, guys. You know what Jesus did? He took his light and he gave it to 12 men and they changed the world. There's a lot more light in this room right now than there used to be. If this was the world full of darkness... We've changed it. Twelve disciples went into the world. And within a few months, I think it was a few years actually, as Pastor Ron was talking, 125,000 people came to know Christ. The problem with our society right now is we have Christians who got lit up like this, and then they got put out. Thank you, guys. Olivia.
The problem was, is their candles went out. They stopped standing for what they believed in. They didn't have anybody to help them stay lit. And their candles went out. A lot of you have your candles right now. Some of them are burning. Some of them you're not really sure what to do with. And there's darkness all around you. And all you got to do is walk out there with your light. I don't know about you, but when I was a little kid, we had a song called This Little Light of Mine. Anybody want to read it? Read it. Sing it. I'm going to let it shine. We all know it. So if we all know it, how many of you are actually taking that light out there? You know it. We read it in the Bible. You sing the song. You go into your high schools and your middle schools, and you're making fun of your friends. You're watching a kid get bullied, and you're not standing up for him. This little light of mine, I'm going to hide in a corner with it, and I'm not going to help my friend. Because I'm all alone and I'm scared. What a difference you could make. You could be the candle that lights a torch, that lights a bonfire that burns brighter than anything in this world. You have that. You have a light that's already burning inside of you and all you have to do is use it. All you have to do is activate it. When you see somebody that needs something... Help them. When you see somebody who's in trouble, help them. When you see somebody getting hurt, you see somebody who's hurting. Listen. Talk to them. Reach out to them. A lot of people are going to bed tonight sad and hurt. And they turn into people that hurt other people because hurt people hurt people. I've been a hurt person, and I have hurt a lot of people. And I feel like a really bad person for it. But I got Jesus who cleaned me for it. The world we know is full of darkness. The Bible tells us it many times. That Satan rules this world and even labels him the prince of this world. He is also called the prince of darkness. If Satan is the prince of darkness, be the light of the world. Somebody read Colossians 3.17. Somebody else get John 14.6. Somebody else John 8.19. Come on, Devin. Go ahead. Go to Colossians 3.17 first. Got it? Um, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Awesome. The world knows that God exists. The heart of the lost aren't certain or they've rejected him. Those who say they do not believe can be given the truth but will not always accept the truth. And what truth is that? Who's got John fourteen six? Hold up. Jesus answered, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Say that one more time. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Pilate asked that question. He said, what is truth? The middle of the time that he's sitting there interrogating Jesus, Jesus has just been beaten for nothing except for our sins. No other reason but that. And Pilate goes, what is truth? And he doesn't give Jesus, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He doesn't even give Jesus a moment to answer it, and he walks away. That's our world these days. We have a lot of questions, but we don't want to know the truth. We don't want to know the truth. There is one son. We are his candles. Makes us the light of the world, the city on a hill. Go out there and spread the light. Who's got John 8, 19? Somebody else, 2 Corinthians 6, 16. John 8, 19 right here. Baby, if you want to come here first. 
John 8, 19 is going to be right here. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. How about somebody new? Kylie, how about you got it? 2 Corinthians 6, 16. Okay, you can take John 10, 14. Go ahead. Then they asked him, where is your father? You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. So where is God? Do we need to read that again? Is it up there? Okay. Then they asked him, where is your father? You do not know me or my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Next, 2 Corinthians 6.16. Go for it, Kylie. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God had said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Oh. Who heard that? Matt, what did I just say? Or what? rather, what did she just say? What did she just read? You got it up there on the screen. You can cheat. Go for it. <laughs> Jeez. Okay, God, God said, hey, why are you worried about idols? I made my temple in you. You are my temple. I will live inside of you. I will be your God. This is building up to something, I promise. All of you are kind of waiting for it. I want it to build. I hope this is stirring in your minds right now. Everybody with me, say yes. yes. Cool. I get worried sometimes. John 10, 14. Who's got that one? Go for it. Loud and clear. The good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Mm. I think that might have been the wrong verse. Try that again, John ten fourteen. But that's actually a really good verse. I mean, you can read that one again. I'm okay with it. <laughs> that's good. Is that the right verse? That's what her says? It's okay. No, you're fine. Read it again. <laughs> Did she say no? <laughs> nope. I already tried that one. No. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and they know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. How do you change the world? How do you be a bright light? How do you get rid of the darkness? That's, that's like 14. 14 through 16? Yeah, okay. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. I got a lot of theology. I'll <laughs> gladly break down there, but no, that's fine. Um, we're getting close. I promise. We're getting close. All right. That's why. That one's backwards. Aha! <laughs> Matthew five sixteen. Somebody quick. Actually, we'll just do this. Somebody read Matthew 5, 14 through 16, but we're going to start on chapter uh, on verse 16, which we've actually already read once before, but that's fine. Who's got it? Go for it, Chelsea. Let the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your, let your light so shine. Before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You're being commanded to do something over and over and over again. In your schools, in your neighborhood, in church, here. That's what being a leader is about. That's what serving is all about. And a lot of you are going to turn into some amazing people that are going to serve the Lord as an adult 
in an amazing way. And you're going to reach people around you that even the people here right now, today, all the leaders here today are not going to be able to do what you do. That's what he, Jesus even said that to his disciples. You're going to do even more amazing things than I've done while I've been here on earth. I'd be doubting that one right then and there, man. I'm not even going to lie. I'm like, I'm going to do better things than you've done while you've been here. You're God. And he said, yeah, but you're going to go in my name. Oh. Let's look back at that. You are the light of the world. As a Christian, do you see where God is? We can go back a couple more verses if you, if you can't respond to that one. Do you see where God is? Where is he? In us. Yes, he is everywhere. Omnipresent, excuse me, omnipotent, which is all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, everywhere at the same time. But he has made his temple in us, and he dwells within us. As a Christian, do you see where God is? Do you see the reason you need to take your light into the dark world? Because you're taking God with you into that dark world to change the world. We all see that the world is dark. We can all see the need for love and kindness, but it can only come from the source. But Mr. Paul, I'm still having trouble understanding what being the light and spreading the light means. Help me. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Now, it's going to say, do not even tax collectors do the same. We don't really look at tax collectors the way they did back then. But a tax collector to them back then was like, hey, man, if you do this for me, you and I are going to be buddies, all right? All right, cool. Hey, still friends, right? Hey, thanks a lot for that really awesome charcuterie board. Ah, thanks for the chocolates. Thanks for the bottles of fine wine. You're a gentleman and a scholar. Thanks for the statues of gold. We're friends. If you love the people who love you, what have you done to change the world? Do not even the tax collectors do that. And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same. What's a Gentile real quick? A Gentile is somebody who's not a Christian, right? It's somebody who is also not raised around the Jewish faith prior to Christ's, Christ's coming, right? We, are you with me? Okay. So these are people that were kind of like lesser humans almost, right? Oh, that's terrible. But Jesus was making a point. He was basically saying that even the uncivilized people understand that, and you guys are civilized. You should know better. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is what spreads light. Somebody read Matthew 28, 19 through 20. We're almost there. I'm sorry I'm taking a little longer than... Okay, good. A lot of, a lot of meat to cover tonight. Adeline, go for it. Thanks, Rihanna. Go ahead. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, te sorry, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of age. Amen. Are you lit up? He's going to be with you till the end of the age. Amen. This is not just your best friend. This is God himself telling you, I'm going to be with you. Always. You glad I didn't use a microphone for that, right? <laughs> Wake up. I love you. I want you to know this. You have two important things to take away from that verse. Two, go a command, and a promise. I'm with you. If you thought you needed courage, you don't. You got enough. You got exactly what you need. God's already given it to you. He's simply telling you to go. Go in faith. Go forward and watch what happens. He's going to use you, and he's going to go with you. You don't have to be afraid. I could be afraid right now because I'm up here talking to a bunch of you guys right now. <laughs> I can be a social butterfly, but ask her. There are times when I don't want to talk to anybody because I get shy. And I get nervous. And I start tripping over my words because I start thinking too hard. And then I rattle on. And then I beat dead horses into the ground. That's a euphemism. <laughs> Light it up. Many of you want examples of darkness so that you can better determine what light to shine. Why? Why do you want to know how evil it is out there? Why? All you have to do is take the light out there. Don't worry about what kind of darkness is out there. Don't worry about what kind of evil is waiting for you out there. You don't need to see the same, some of the things that we as adults have seen. And some of you guys who are teenagers have seen some stuff some of the adults haven't even seen yet. And hopefully might not ever see. This isn't an age thing. Some of you have already gone through things I've never even gone through. But I've also gone through things that you're going through. The only difference is do we act on it or do we just suppress it? Do we take our light, what God has done in our lives, out there into the dark world and say, look, I know what you're going through because I've been there. You don't have to be a certain age. You have to be obedient. You just have to go out there and change the world. And some of you, again, it's really easy. You're in a high school. You're in a middle school. If I can be on a job and talk to some guy randomly, find out where he's from, express interest in his life, genuinely, too, I'm not making it up. I seriously want to know how he's doing. I want to know what his life's all about. I can't change the world without being kind and loving, right? This guy's never going to see me again. Do I worry about that? Do I let that say, well, I, I'm not going to know him again, so why go talk to him, you know? No, I take that effort. I want to get to know you. Why? Because I just want to get to know you. There's no agenda here. That in and of itself is the light. Now, if they ask any questions about why I care so much, I'm going to say, hey, you want to watch some Waterstone Church on YouTube? Yeah. We got a Facebook. No, I'm not. I am going to throw that at him, but at the same time, I'm going to tell him it's because God loves you. It's not about Waterstone Church. Waterstone Church is simply trying to do the same thing I'm talking about. We're trying to reach the lost out there. We're trying to be a light in a dark world. It's not about a name brand. It's not about a blue lit stage. It's not about worship services on, Monday, on Sunday. Excuse me. What it is about is taking a light out into a dark world. Put a name on it if you want to. But it's what Jesus said to do, not what Pastor Ron said to do. Pastor Ron is just reiterating, Jesus said, go. The word gave life to everything that was created. And his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. 
That's exciting for me. We've covered what it means to be a light, to spread the light. We have to walk as Jesus did. That is making a difference in the world. It's not addressing each of the problems we've mentioned in the beginning of this message. It's demonstrating the love of Christ. Actions speak louder than words. Look, if Satan is the prince of darkness, then be the light of the world, just as they say in Matthew. Just as we've read multiple times tonight. So how do you be a big light in a dark world? The problem with social media is you forget how to be social. Talk to me. I'm asking you a question. It's not hard. Somebody interact with me. This isn't a like button. You don't have to share it. How do you be a light in a dark world? Right, but I want, I want, I want some of you all to answer. Some of you all have been staring at me all night long, and this has been great. I've got your attention for a second. Fine. Make sure this has hit you, though. Talk back. Elias, go for it. Yeah, how do you do that? However God wants you to get involved. However God tells you, move, go. Right? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this. You took a guy who very easily could just sit here like, Moses and say, but Lord, I don't talk well. Lord, I stutter. Lord, I get nervous and shy. Lord, I start rambling. People aren't going to want to listen to me. I look goofy with my big, big, giant beard. I stutter and say words that aren't even supposed to be said. But God, you called me to do something. I'm trying to be a light right now along with the rest of the leaders that are here. And Father, we're just praying that the light is burning inside of everyone here tonight, of all the students' hearts. Father, I pray that they will just go out there and change the world. I never thought that these would be the days that I would live to see. <laughs> I had such a different picture in mind, but you didn't. Lord, you knew already. So, Father, I pray that we stop worrying about the signs of the times and, and all the different things we're seeing, Father, let us not focus on that, but Father, let's focus on your light and let's take it out there in the world. We can read about it all day long, Lord, but until we actually show it, until we actually put some action to it, it's just words on a page. Lord, be glorified in everything we say and do, that it might be pleasing to you and bring glory to you. Lord, we love you. We ask in all things, you'll be glorified. It's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Guys, give Mr. Paul a round of applause for what the Lord just did through him. Thank you, Paul. Um, I want to challenge you guys. So before we go to life groups, here's the thing. We always ask you questions in life group. We always have at least three for you guys to process and answer. But I want to remind you that life group is also a place where you can flip that and ask us questions. So if there's anything from tonight's message, from anything that you heard or saw on the screen that you don't fully understand, you're not dumb, you're human with questions. And we want you to ask us. So don't be shy. Just literally, if your leader just dives into que to asking you questions but you've got one, put your hand up, it's like a school thing, and just say, I, I need to ask something. And as long as it pertains to, to faith, to Jesus, to what we're talking about, we want to, we want to answer that for you, okay? So we're going to watch a, a quick highlight video, and then I'll share with you who's going to get our student lounge tonight, all right? Check out the screen. For those of you who don't know me, I am Elias, and I have attended Waterstone for two years. It's time. Next week is Underground Church Extended Edition. Yes, two uninterrupted hours of our favorite classic games here at the church. So make plans to bring your friends as we play the ultimate game that's all about bringing things hidden in the darkness out into the light. The last week of the month means it's turkey time, and we want you to know we're so grateful for every single one of you.
keep in mind as your family prepares its annual Thanksgiving traditions, whether that's going out and serving in the community or making a ginormous meal, or both, that we're off on the 25th. Waterstone will resume its Wednesday night gatherings the following week for another amazing student testimony when Emily shares all about her faith journey. Join us on December 2nd as Emily shares her faith journey with us all for the very first time. She'll tell us how Waterstone Young gave her the accountability needed to fully commit to Christ and repent from a stronghold that she just couldn't shake on her own. She will also talk about how two awesome surprises the Lord had in store for her as he ordered her next steps in serving as the vessel he designed her to be. You won't want to miss it, so be praying for Emily and invite your friends to join us the first Wednesday night of December for a powerful testimony of faith. To catch up on all these highlights, visit our Facebook and Instagram pages, public and private, at MyWaterstoneYoung.